in order to get to a future that does not approach two degrees centigrade, we have to not burn $20 trillion of oil on the books of the oil companies. That is one hell of a difficult thing to do, but we have to do it. It's easy to sort of point to a lot of different groups and call them the enemy. To me, the enemy is time. The sooner we act and the more that we do, the bolder we are, the better off we're gonna be. If we don't step in now and start to engage our communities around climate change, then we're not gonna be able to make the big steps that we need to make in order to turn this thing around. There are many, many creative ways that people can use their voices and speak out about what we understand with confidence, what's uncertain, what likely outcomes are for our climate system, and everything we hold dear if we do nothing about this problem. Now more than ever, having a respected civic discourse on the challenging issues of our time is incredibly important. Fate still lies within our own hands, and Climate One is about saying, no, we have control over our destiny. So here's our moment to speak truthfully about where we are on climate. And in the strangest way, it might be the moment that people are actually ready to listen. Thanks for joining us for this live presentation of the 2022 Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. I'm Greg Dalton in San Francisco, and I'd like to acknowledge the Ramatush people who have inhabited these lands for 10,000 years. We're producing today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. You can subscribe to the pod wherever you get your pods. Later this year, we're going to produce a special episode of This Year in Climate, so keep an eye out for that. If you're watching on the live stream and have questions, please put your questions in the comment box, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the program. I'm delighted to welcome Stefan Ramstorff, Professor of Physics of the Oceans at Potsdam University and head of the Earth System Analysis Department of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact. Impact Research. Professor Romstorff is the winner of the 2022 Stephen Schneider Award presented by Climate One. Stefan, welcome to Climate One. Thanks, Greg. It's a great honor. Great to see you here. Back when you were just getting started in 2007 as a young scientist, you were attacked for calling out mainstream journalists who were skeptical of climate. What was the nature of those attacks and what was that for, like for you personally? You had a young child at that time. Uh, yeah, indeed, that uh, put a big stress on me. Obviously, if you're attacked uh, and discredited in mainstream media, and uh, calling out uh, disinformation on climate change. And how does that, uh, how has the conversation evolved or changed since then? Because now, uh, yeah, what's it like now compared to then? Is it better or worse now? Well, it actually, I think it's a lot better now because the uh, debate about climate change has moved on a lot. And uh, at least, you know, I can only speak for Germany here. There is no outright or very little outright denial of the basic scientific facts. The whole discussion has shifted to criticizing, uh, you know, the solutions, renewable energy, electromobility, etc. So it's uh, the, the debate also in this field contains a lot of false information put out by interest groups, but it doesn't concern the basic uh, researchers, climate science researchers like myself so much anymore. Right. It seems like a lot of the skepticism about climate stems from the fact that climate models were predicting effects that most people weren't yet experiencing in their lives. You know, it was saying this kind of far away in time and far away, far away lands. You know, why do you think people distrust models and how both as a scientist and science communicator, do you explain why we should believe in the predictive models? Well, in a way, I can understand that people distrust models as such because they don't know what's in there. And um, yeah, that, so they don't really understand in detail what we are doing. But I think one of the bigger factors beyond the healthy distrust of models that, that 
as scientists, we also have, of course, we, we are very critical of each other's models and hopefully our own as well. And you really have to learn what a model can do well and what it cannot do well. Um, but I think a big issue with the distrust of the general public of models and climate science uh, overall is that this has been deliberately stoked by interest groups. And uh, so it's in a way, it's not surprising that there is a lot of distrust there. And have the models been conservative? Have the models actually underestimated the, the pace and magnitude of changes that we've seen in the atmosphere? That again depends on what you're looking at. If you are looking at the change in global average temperature, that has been spot on in the models since the 1970s and 80s. Already those early models got that pretty well right. Not only the models uh, by university scientists uh, or NASA, but also by uh, Exxon, for example, yeah. did their own modeling and they also got it pretty well right. Uh, there are other things that are more complicated physics, like rainfall extremes, for example, is more difficult. And there, there is still a lot of uncertainty in regional terms where, where you expect what kind of extreme precipitation changes. And in one of my uh, fields of main fields of research for quite a few years has been sea level rise. That has also turned out to be quite a complex problem because there are several contributors, especially the, the ice sheets are very difficult to predict in their behavior. The sliding behavior it depends on the material properties of the ice. And uh, there we unfortunately have a history of underestimating sea level rise. And uh, the IPCC had to raise its sea level projections several times, basically every time in the last three times a new report came out. The sea level projections have become more pessimistic as we learn more about potential ice sheet instabilities. So what I heard there is that, yeah, models are like a black box to most people, even me. Like, I've never actually seen a climate model. I've talked to lots of people who make them and, and uh, talked about them, but I've never actually seen a climate model. So they're a black box. And on surface temperature, they've been very accurate. And on sea level rise, they've actually underestimated something that is, is very complex. Um, you it, you uh, have said that running, we're running toward a cliff in a fog. You said that we're running toward a cliff in a fog and we don't know exactly where the cliff is. How far can models go toward letting us see through that fog? Well, this quote was about tipping points where we indeed, we know there are these tipping points, but we typically have a fairly large uncertainty range about exactly where this tipping point is going to be by at, at how much warming are we going to cross that tipping point. And this is a classic case because tipping points by definition are highly nonlinear phenomena. So complicated physics and this nonlinear phenomena, they depend exactly on the, on the boundary conditions and in many cases uh, we just can't pin that down very easily. Whereas right, so other things, like I mentioned, the global mean temperature just follows a global energy balance. We know how much radiation is coming in, how much long wave radiation is going out and how that's going to change when we increase the greenhouse gases because it's a fairly smooth change in the global energy budget. And so that's pretty easy to predict. But those cliffs, like the tipping points, uh, they are often well understood in principle, but not where exactly that cliff is. Let's talk a little more about uh, tipping points. In one of your talks, I've seen you show a graphic of various tipping points and at what temperatures they would be triggered. Can you talk through us some of the most imminent dangers? Because there's kind of three bands of tipping points, those that could happen relatively soon, those that are sort of medium term, and those that are, that are further out. And for those people watching the live stream, they can see this image. Uh, so t tell us some of the tipping points. What are the ones that are closest and ones that are a little further out? Yeah, this graph comes from a review paper in science uh, that was published this September by David Armstrong McKay and colleagues from several countries. And in a way, it, it did really shock me to some extent because there are now indeed, uh, when you put together the latest science, six tipping points that are even 
uh, not just possible but even likely to be crossed within that range between 1.5 and 2.0 degrees of global warming. And we're about 1.1 1. 1 now, so that's not very far away, right? Exactly. That is a major shift in our perception about tipping points because uh, back in the time when I also discussed that with Stephen Schneider, etc., we considered these uh, low probability, high impact events. That means we were assuming they had a low probability of occurring. That has really changed now that uh, indeed, uh, let me name some of these, the coral reefs, for example, a long time it has been known that they have critical temperature uh, thresholds and we are now already since 2015 in the middle of a global coral die-off. So we are basically we're in that uh, tipping point process now and the latest IPCC report uh, reckons that after two degrees warming basically no coral reef will be left. Another one is the West Antarctic ice sheet which may already have passed the tipping point. Uh, I should add that uh, the tipping point is where the further uh, deterioration and actually complete loss of the ice sheet is already programmed in by self-amplifying feedback, even without further warming. Uh, so that's what the tipping point is. And it means you can't necessarily see it when it's happening with these ice sheets because they are moving very slowly and there's no dramatic change once you've passed the tipping point. But what it means is it's going to continue to decay until it's gone. In case of West Antarctica, that would be three meters global sea level rise. Um, similar uh, Greenland ice sheet, it's a different mechanism, but the same thing. We may already be passing the tipping point very soon. Uh, we might even already have passed it, and that would just mean the total loss of the Greenland ice sheet would be programmed in to occur over the next centuries and uh, unstoppable, basically. And, so let me just uh, jump in here, Stefan. These are places. Global sea level rise. Let me just jump in here, Stefan. Uh, these are places most Europeans, Americans will never go to or see the West Antarctic ice sheet or the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, what does it mean for someone living in Europe, North America, anywhere? So why, why should a person care about these faraway things? Well, in case of the ice sheets, the main reason to care about them is the sea level rise they are causing. And uh, we are expecting, the IPCC is expecting uh, half a meter to one meter sea level rise by the end of this century. But with a big one-sided uncertainty to uh, much higher values like two meters by the end of the century, five meters by the year 2150, uh, as a result of potentially passing these tipping points where amplifying feedbacks really destabilize these ice sheets. And that means basically the loss of most of the world's coastal cities and also natural ecosystems along the coast, beaches being washed away by the rising seas, etc. And these things are closer and more likely than you estimated a couple of decades ago. Is that correct? Absolutely. Even, even closer than I thought five years ago. Wow. And then there's some that are further out that are, you know, sort of happen between two and four degrees. That is, you know, the Sahel. Tell us about the range, the Amazon and the Sahel, the things that happen between two and four degrees of warming, which we hope we won't get to. And we're currently on a trajectory. Um, if, if everybody meets their Paris climate agreements, we won't um, get to, to that point. But it could happen. It could happen. And uh, for the Amazon rainforest, uh, there is a tipping point where it simply gets too dry to uh, be maintained. And that has to do with the fact that the rainforest generates its own rain. It recycles the water that falls in one area. Uh, the roots pick it up from the ground again, push it up to the leaves and they evaporate it again. And so that, that rainfall is recycled again and again by the forest. 
and uh, that is a self-sustaining feedback which is typical for a tipping point because when you stress that too much it turns into the opposite the, the forest uh, dies back and that recycles less rain that amplifies that dieback and then the amazon rainforest basically threatens to get so dry that big parts uh, go up in flames now with the sahel and west african monsoon this is actually uh, in a way a positive feedback in uh, uh, sorry a positive tipping point i would say and um, because we're talking about a potential greening there, like we had in the first half of the Holocene, uh, where we had a stronger West African monsoon bringing in moisture uh, from the tropical Atlantic. And uh, so this could actually lead to a greening of the southern fringes of the Sahara. And so not all tipping points are negative, and we are all hoping for a societal tipping point where the world society finally takes climate change seriously enough to stop it. So there will be some, you know, that's a, a rare example of uh, actually something, a positive trend anywhere, and particularly for Africa. So there, are you saying there'll be winners and losers in this? Well, of course, that tipping point for the greening uh, Sahara will only be reached if we have pushed warming already far too far, way beyond two degrees, and we are in the middle of fighting a massive disaster. So that is little consolation that further out there may be even some positive change. You interacted a fair amount with Steve Schneider, the pioneering climate scientist and communicator. I first learned about tipping points from Steve uh, 15 years ago, and, and he said we won't know that we've passed them and perhaps until 50 years after uh, we've passed them. He was the first member of the Climate One Advisory Council. We give this award in his memory every year that you're receiving. What did you learn from Steve, and how did he impact the field of climate science and communication? Well, actually, the first thing I remember about Steve is his 1989 book called Global Warming, Are We Entering the Greenhouse Century, which I read as a PhD student in the, in the late 80s when the book came out. And, and that was, to me, uh, one of the eye-openers at the time about that uh, greenhouse problem. And indeed, I had a fair amount of interactions with Steve over the years, and uh, I would call him a friend. And uh, one of the things I talked quite a bit uh, to him about and where he was very vocal in public as well was the thing about uh, thinking about risk, about probabilities and to also take seriously low probability events. Uh, this is something I really learned from Steve because the IPCC uh, until quite recently actually actually until the last report, I would even say, has been focusing strongly on the best estimate scenarios of, you know, what is most likely to happen, uh, but not focusing on the tail end of the probability distribution, uh, what risks are lurking there. It's, it's a bit like analyzing the risk of running a nuclear power plant and you just look at scenarios where everything runs according to plan. Uh, but of course, to understand risk, you have to also look at the things that may go wrong, even if it's not very likely. And so Steve and I, we were both quite vocal about uh, this issue to consider the risks as well. And uh, I remember in 2000, he invited me to write an editorial uh, for his uh, journal, the first climate change journal, which was called Climatic Change, um, on the thresholds, uh, what we now call tipping points, of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Much and of your work has been in the field Steve of... Was uh, really a mentor to me was public climate science communication. Hmm. He was really uh, somebody who... He encouraged everybody, basically, to get involved in the public debate. It's not enough to just put your stuff in the peer-reviewed technical literature. He was convinced you have to uh, put it out into the public arena and debate it. And uh, yeah, I, I really considered him a mentor who kept encouraging me uh, to go down this path. 
And so what do you consider the role of a scientist? Because there's some data about whether scientists ought to stick to their, stay in their lane, stick to their laboratory, what they know, not veer into policy, not get into politics. Uh, so others say there's a moral uh, responsibility. What do you view as the role of a scientist at this time focusing on this? Well, I think we definitely have a duty to explain what we're doing and what we are finding out to the general public. Like doctors have a duty to warn their patients that smoking causes lung cancer. You know, you just, if you know about a risk that affects people, you have to speak up. I don't think uh, that necessarily it's a role of a physicist to tell the government what it should be doing. Um, and uh, we generally, I think, as scientists don't, uh, the IPCC doesn't. It's, you know, when the politicians um, want to know uh, how do we stop global warming, for example, at two degrees or so, then as natural scientists, we can say how much, uh, uh, what's the emissions budget, you know, how much can we still emit in terms of CO2 if we want to stick to that goal. And so I think we need to communicate the risks, but not necessarily solutions. But there are other scientists like uh, renewable energy experts, economists, etc., that are also working, for example, at the Potsdam Institute where I work, uh, which are really engaged in designing policy measures, for example, uh, a carbon pricing scheme that is fair so that low-income households actually have, have more money in the bank afterwards and so the burden for changing the energy system uh, and reducing CO2 emissions should really be paid by the high emitters which are typically the people with more income. Yeah, the global north. We've done a number of episodes on that on Climate One recently from COP27. Um, much of your work has been in the field of paleoclimatology. How has studying ice ages informed your understanding of current and future climate change and how do you communicate with people who average person has a hard time really grasping geological time scales yes uh, i i quite early already when i started as a postdoc turned to studying paleoclimate because uh, you know i was studying uh, abrupt ocean circulation changes and um, you know, we can't observe that in the last hundred years, but we can if we go back further in time because they have happened repeatedly during the last ice age. So if we want to test our models, can they reproduce uh, these phenomena realistically? We have to compare them uh, to paleoclimatic so-called proxy data that come from the ice cores or uh, sediment cores from the deep ocean, etc. And uh, most people, that I talk to or give lectures, uh, public lectures, they are amazed how much we actually know about past climate changes and about the mechanisms, especially when you look at the past few million years, uh, which of course is a short part of the total Earth history of, of four and a half billion years. But the last few million years, we have very nice data from sediment cores all over the planet. Uh, we know the, the waxing and waning of the big continental ice sheets. And with our climate model, for example, we can now reproduce all the ice ages of the last three million years, um, just driven by the cycles in the Earth orbit, the so-called Milankovitch cycles, which are the cause of these cyclical ice ages. And so what, what that teaches us, I think that was your question, uh, I think the main thing it teaches us is that the Earth system, the climate system, is a sensitive beast that responds strongly when you change the forcing, um, for example, either by these orbital cycles or by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. This is what we call a forcing, radiative forcing. And we know from the Earth history that the Earth responds very strongly to this. So that's the so-called climate sensitivity. How sensitive is our climate system? And uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Wally Broker, who unfortunately also already died like Steve Schneider, uh, I worked uh, with him on the panel on abrupt climate change. He used to say, uh, the, the climate is an angry beast and we are poking it with sticks. 
It's an angry beast and a sensitive beast. That's quite a quite a powerful image. It's you know, um, indigenous people would say yeah, it's a delicate balance that we're we're disrupting by burning fossil fuels. Um, why are seas at different? Uh, why are seas rising at different rates on the Atlantic and Pacific coast of North America? Well, there are several factors why sea level rise is not everywhere equal. Uh, there is, first of all, there is a, a you know different rates of heating and thermal expansion in different parts of the ocean. Then there is the gravity effect of the ice loss. One surprising fact for lay people is that if you melt down the Greenland ice sheet, the sea level at the Greenland coast will drop. And that is because the ice sheets are so big, they have a big gravitational pull and they pull the seawater towards them, raising the sea level along the coast where near the ice sheet. And when the ice sheet melts down, the water moves away from that coast. And so uh, that is this so-called gravity fingerprint uh, phenomenon. And another factor why we have different rates of sea level rise in different regions is changes in either the ocean currents or the prevailing winds, which also exert friction on the sea surface and push waters towards a coast or away from a coast. You mentioned the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet and how there's some melting there that's uh, faster, it's complicated, but faster than you would have predicted just a few years ago. We have enough ice left on Earth to raise sea level by 60 meters. That's 100, almost 200 feet. This is a mind-blowing number. Obviously, you know, in your paleo work, you know it's been that high before, but not on an Earth with 8 billion people. So how do you imagine a 60-meter sea level rise and still function? I mean, that, that's just a mind-blowing number. Yeah, that, that is a really big number. And uh, we know that at the end of the last ice age, you know, which is only 10,000 years ago, so th that end, I mean, the height of the ice age was 20,000 years ago. And then uh, between 20,000 and 10,000, the ice age came to an end. We moved into the Holocene uh, warm period, the interglacial. And there the sea level rose by 120 meters because two-thirds of those ice age uh, ice masses on the continents were melting in response to about seven degrees of warming from the ice age uh, to the Holocene. Seven degrees centigrade global warming caused 120 meters of sea level rise. So the fact that we still have 65 meters worth of sea level rise lying in form of ice on the continents, to me, uh, it doesn't mean that sea level will ever rise by 65 meters because, um, well, certainly not in the next 1,000 years because Antarctica is simply right on the South Pole and very cold and it's uh, the main part, East Antarctica, is not going to melt down. But what it means is that we can afford to lose only a few percent of that continental ice. And, you know, last time we had several degrees of warming you know, two thirds of the ice melted, 120 meters of sea level rise. And now we're heading for three, four degrees warming, maybe half as much. And uh, we can't even afford to lose just kind of a few percent of the ice. Even one meter of sea level rise would for many places be really catastrophic. We're already witnessing real problems after the 20 centimeters of rise that we have seen uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, we have already at the U.S. Uh, East Coast, for example, this so-called nuisance flooding um, in, in quite a few places, uh, the Carolinas, um, Boston, for example, where even with the tidal cycles, you get some low-lying streets underwater. So some people say that even if we stop emissions, there's momentum in the system. Warming will continue. Seas will continue to rise. Uh, you know, how much is already baked in? How much sea level rise in, is already baked in? Well, let's first say how much further warming is baked in because a lot of people think we are already inevitably going to surpass the 1.5 degree. That is not what the science is saying. Um, the science uh, suggests that once we have reached zero CO2 emissions, the temperature will not rise further. 
Great. Let's just hold on to that for a moment to say the science. So sometimes the public discourse gets darker than the science and we get these moments of, of, of light. I want, I like to pause and hold on to them that once we stop emitting, the warming will stop. That's really good news. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the good part of us causing it. It means we can stop it. And there is in the global temperature, there's not much inertia. It is true that there is thermal inertia in the upper ocean. Um, so the oceans will catch up with some warming even after we stop raising the CO2 levels. But on, on the other hand, um, there is also a, an inertia, very similar mechanism in the CO2 uptake by the upper ocean. So once we are at zero CO2 emissions, the upper oceans are going to also catch up until they're equilibrated with the atmospheric CO2 and uh, take a, a bit of the CO2 out again. And these two phenomena, the thermal inertia and the CO2 uptake inertia of the upper ocean roughly cancel to keep global mean temperature constant after we uh, stop emitting CO2. So that, that is really what we have to aim for, get to zero emissions um, before or, or at the time where we reach 1.5 degrees. And that is theoretically possible. With the politics we have now, it is not possible, of course. We have to be treating this problem as a top priority, like a wartime situation, basically, in order to get such a, a really fast uh, uh, end of fossil fuel use. Now, there is, of course, a lot of inertia in the sea level uh, issue, because the ice sheets are very slow to melt. That's the main reason, but also heat penetrating into the oceans uh, is also a gradual slow process. So after we stabilize the global temperature, sea level will continue to rise for many centuries. And the best we can hope to achieve by stopping global warming is to prevent a further acceleration of sea level rise. So I heard a lot of positive news there that you hear a lot about net zero goals these days. When we get to zero emissions, that some, some of the bad things will stop pretty quickly. Some will continue slowly, rising seas, but the thermal acceleration. So that really gives me encouragement that these net zero goals we're talking about that are, we'll see pretty immediate effects when we get to get there. It won't be some long delay. Uh, that we'll see some pretty uh, quick results, that it's a goal worth fighting for and getting toward. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it over land. When the sun comes up in the morning, you know, it gets hot within hours. So that's how fast uh, the atmosphere responds to a change in radiative forcing. The inertia is in the oceans. And so maybe in, in coastal regions, things will not uh, be noticeable so quickly, but uh, a lot of the CO2 effect is, is very immediate and with every molecule of CO2 that we add, we change the radiation balance and once we stop doing this, uh, we will stop making things worse. Right. So with, given all that we've talked uh, today, Stefan, some of the things are troubling, happening faster, more likely. The really bad things are closer, more likely. Other things like we're learning that, wow, the, the system is really responsive. If we stop, you know, poking the beast with a stick, it'll, it'll uh, calm quickly. How do you feel personally about all of this? Where, where do you sit personally about all the information you live with every day? Well, you know, sometimes it uh, gets me down. Uh, it's not so much the science information. It's when I see, you know, terrible cyclone hitting some poor population and people really suffering from these events that gets me down. And uh, I have to also admit freely here that the morning I woke up when Donald Trump was elected and I heard this on the radio, I cried because I knew what a setback that would be for fighting global warming and, and for the Paris Agreement, etc. cetera. Um, so there are moments like that that do get me down. By and large, I just have been in this business for more, more than 30 years now. And so I just try to take a professional attitude and uh, uh, keep my, my mental balance, uh, emotional balance as uh, much as I can. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that was a very dark day for a lot of people and did set us back. Though a lot of uh, a lot of good things are happening now. Certainly, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been more progress than many people 
could have you know, been waiting a long time for us in the United States. One way to avoid tipping points would be could be dimming the sun to cool the earth, possibly known as solar and geoengineering. What do you think of geoengineering? Is climate inaction making solar geoengineering more likely, perhaps even inevitable? Um, I, I think it's a terrible idea because of uh, huge side effects and uh, also to a large extent unknown side effects that this would have and uh, you have to consider that this CO2 that we add will remain in the atmosphere at an elevated level for literally tens of thousands of years. Wow. So. Um, we actually in my department have a couple of projects from the Swiss and the German authorities about nuclear waste storage because these people are interested what happens in the next million years. And so because we can successfully model the ice ages of the last three million years and these Milankovitch cycles of the Earth orbit can be calculated with astronomical precision also into the future. Uh, we, we can also predict uh, the next ice ages. The next one would be happening in 50,000 years from now. Um, but we can say that that is practically already cancelled because even in 50,000 years, CO2 will be still so elevated in the atmosphere that the new ice age, the next ice age, will not be happening. Um, so this is, this is very long term. And this, the counter effect by adding these particles shading the sun in the atmosphere, what some people discuss, etc., they will wash out uh, within weeks, basically, if you don't keep renewing them all the time. And so once we do this, we add a lot of CO2, but at the same time, we add kind of short-term shading aerosols in the, in the stratosphere or so. We will have to keep doing this for tens of thousands of years to keep a habitable planet. And, you know, wow. at that point, we would hand over the control over the climate system to humans rather than leaving it as a self-regulating system. And I think this is a terrible idea. There's a saying that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The jet stream is slowing, according to different studies using different methods. How does the melting Arctic ice affect the jet stream, and how could that affect Europe? I talked to people who are very worried in Europe about the jet stream changing. Yes, indeed. This is a current uh, scientific discussion that we uh, also uh, took a big uh, role in already uh, for quite a long time. The changes in the jet stream uh, data show that in summer the jet stream is uh, slowing down. Uh, also further analysis shows that it's getting more wavy. Um, in the winter you get these uh, instabilities in the polar vortex letting out uh, cold air outbreaks from the Arctic uh, to adjacent continents. And uh, these things have to do with the disproportionate warming of the Arctic, which has actually uh, warmed three to four times faster than the global average temperature in, in the last decades. And that basically reduces the temperature gradient that drives the jet stream. You know, the, the difference between the subtropical atmosphere and the polar atmosphere, uh, that the temperature difference is getting smaller because the North Pole is warming up such a lot. And uh, we think that this uh, leads to more persistent weather, especially in Europe. So same weather situation lasting longer and thereby becoming extreme. You know, if you have one week with no rain, it's no, not a problem. But, you know, if you have three weeks with no rain, you have a problem. Or when you have a low pressure system dumping a lot of rain, you also have a problem when it stays for a week over the same place because it's going to cause massive flooding uh, like we had last year in uh, Germany, Belgium um, and the Netherlands. Yeah, that was quite uh, striking. Uh, you know, Angela Merkel was a huge figure on the world stage for a long time. Uh, she was a physicist. She knows the science. What has been her climate legacy? Well, unfortunately, um, I would say she was very good at uh, using nice words and especially on the international arena and uh, quite, you know, 
riveting speeches about global warming and uh, she's been I, I've seen her several times in person speaking to audiences of scientists at, at meetings that we organize etc and she always said the right things and then you know she intervened in Brussels against emission standards for uh, motor cars etc and uh, also you know I think her, her government basically stopped uh, our photovoltaics uh, industry and our wind industry. They strongly halted the, the exponential growth of wind power in Germany because there was a lot of uh, fossil fuel interest there and our strong dependence on Russian uh, fossil gas now that we are now suffering with the Ukraine war from. Uh, this dependence uh, also that was all growing during her government. So I think uh, climate uh, people here in Germany are especially disappointed with her because she did understand the problem and she said the right thing, uh, but she didn't act accordingly. What energy trajectory is Germany on now? I know that they just signed a long-term liquid natural gas contract with Qatar uh, that goes out uh, into several, uh, more than a decade from now. What trajectory is Germany on now? I was there recently and felt the, the solidarity with Ukraine and people were not uh, used to really trying to reduce their use of gas. What trajectory is Germany on now? Well, this is actually quite difficult to say because uh, on one hand uh, we now have a climate ministry run by uh, a green minister, Robert Habeck, uh, who are working hard to remove obstacles to the uh, renewable energies and uh, build them up faster. And we are now in Germany uh, at around about 50% of our electricity is coming from, from renewables and uh, the plan is to be at 80% in 2030. Um, that's the good news and the uh, actually a very new report by the International Energy Agency on renewables has really upped the, the estimates dramatically how quickly the renewables worldwide will increase and including because they now say uh, now after the attack on Ukraine uh, there will be an acceleration also in Germany with the buildup of uh, renewable electricity generation. Uh, that's the one side but you mentioned those LNG terminals there's a big uh, debate about those because they, it's a kind of fossil uh, lock-in effect and people try to say, oh, well, they can later be used for hydrogen, green importing green hydrogen, but I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this. I'm outside my, my core expertise here, but uh, I see reports from uh, experts saying this is just kind of greenwashing. These terminals are not suited for hydrogen, and uh, so this, this, uh, this is not going to happen. And uh, yeah, environmental organization here is going to court against these uh, LNG terminals because they are basically uh, contravening uh, Germans' climate policy, just like that uh, British new coal mine that is going to be opened that really undermines the credibility of Great Britain in climate policy. I just see the, the fossil fuel lobby kind of, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. They're popping up everywhere. You, you try to um, make this transition away from fossil fuels, but the, the power of the forces that want to hold on to fossil fuel burning is still very strong and, you know, they are making record profits at the moment and they're using that money also for lobbying power. So how do you think that, I understand this is not a, a physicist question, but how do you think that power is challenged or changed? Well, I think... Um, you know, by the public basically demanding climate action. And uh, I think a big uh, impact um, has was by the Fridays for Future movement and the general climate movement that has really grown in recent years, uh, the last five years or so, it has become quite powerful. And uh, I can see that, um, you know, fossil fuel dependent governments uh, like in Australia get voted out. Uh, also in Germany, of course. I mean, we, we could have had Angela Merkel's party again in government, I think, had it not been for this 
the climate issue and the, the massive flooding we had last uh, summer in West Germany. Um, the climate topic uh, is now something that voters demand and that people, the young people especially, demand in the streets. And I think this is the kind of pressure that is needed because as scientists e explaining in sober terms in IPCC reports uh, what is at stake. We've been doing this since 1990 when the first IPCC report came out. Um, and it's just not happening. So I think it needs more political pressure. We've had an attack on climate and uh, we've had an attack on science and, and a lot of reason-based thinking in the United States seems to have subsided a little bit. What advice do you have to people who want to pursue science and are maybe turned off by the nasty politics surrounding science these days? Um, I would say do it anyway. And uh, I think... Um, go into the solutions field, you know, study energy systems, etc. Because, uh, yeah, basically, we understand the climate system well enough to know what we should be doing. And uh, we really need people working on the solutions. And how do you manage and how would you, you know, advise people about the emotional roller coaster of doing this you know it's a tough sell to say well do this work it's noble it's important you may not make much money you may be personally attacked how do you, what would you say about the you know and how do you personally manage manage the emotional roller coaster of dealing with some pretty heavy topics and being attacked for doing it yeah i i think as i said i I, first of all, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person by nature. Right. And uh, I have been at this for 30 years and got used to a lot. I got hardened uh, by experience. And um, yeah, you know, I don't wholeheartedly, you know, I sometimes give talks to school kids and they ask me, you know, do you recommend a career in science? And, um, you know, I can't wholeheartedly recommend it, especially, I don't know, about the US or so, but in the German system, you have to tell people, well, you may get a lot of string of two year contracts and you never know whether it continues or you get a permanent position. Uh, that, that adds to it, this insecurity. If you want to start a family, for example, it's actually not so easy to be a scientist. So I, I have to tell them, you know, you have to be really passionate about the science in order to go down this path. It is rewarding. Um, I, I really uh, feel I'm absolutely at the right place in the world of science. I meet fantastic people and uh, very smart people and yeah, highly motivated people. And it's simply the world where I belong. But uh, you have to really want it, you know. It's, it's not something you start because you think, uh, oh, well, it's a nice... Uh, safe job and earn a lot of money that's that then don't go into science that's for sure we have a couple of questions from our live stream audience the first one even if we stop our co2 emissions if we pass the tipping point for the release of co2 methane from permafrost will release about 1.4 trillion tons of greenhouse gases so what about the natural release of greenhouse gases methane in particular yeah, that is a, a, a question that often comes up. This is the, the, the question of the, the further amplification of the warming by this kind of feedback. And uh, I think there is some rather exaggerated fears about that, to be honest, and uh, especially about the methane issue. It, I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a real issue, but it, it, we're not heading for a runaway greenhouse effect or so. Um, uh, there was this uh, famous hothouse paper, so, uh, so to speak, that was, became well known a couple of years ago, which if you read the media reports, it sounded like uh, we're heading towards a kind of runaway greenhouse destabilizing uh, the whole climate system in this way. Um, but that's not actually what the paper says. You know, it's, uh, it's just, that is really a low probability risk. And uh, they try to quantify these amplifying feedbacks like additional CO2 release from the biosphere because forests die or burn and, and methane and all these things. And uh, overall, they concluded that could 
add about half a degree centigrade of warming. And so it's not as dramatic as a runaway effect, but uh, of course it is a real concern, but it is not a kind of catastrophic concern. And But of course the, the faster we stop global warming, the safer we are that we are not actually passing tipping points of the Amazon rainforest and it dying and releasing a lot of carbon dioxide and these things. Right, I think that's the second time so I've So nature it. helps us. You know, having a stable ecosystem on this planet, that really helps us and uh, including the biodiversity that we need for that. And we should really safeguard that because it's our greatest ally in, in combating global warming is having a functioning global biosphere. And that's a good thing to, to remember as the, the uh, diversity uh, conference of parties is, is coming up and that biodiversity can be our friend. Uh, another question from Livestream Mark asks, do we know why the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the world? Yes, there is a couple of factors. Um, one of them is the ice albedo uh, effect that is uh, very simple to understand. The ice is a very bright surface, also the snow on the high latitude continent areas, and it reflects a lot of sunlight, um, where, you know, in the summer there is a lot of sunlight up there, and that gets reflected by ice surfaces, but when they're shrinking uh, or gone, then you, a dark surface, dark ocean comes uh, underneath, and that then absorbs all the sun. That, that is probably the biggest. There are some more complicated uh, feedback effects like that, but uh, this so-called polar amplification uh, is a well-known thing that also happened during the ice ages, for example, um, and the ice albedo feedback is, is a major player. On Climate One today, we've been discussing the physics of oceans and the role of science in the public sphere with Dr. Stefan Romsdorf, winner of the 2022 Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. Each year, Climate One grants this $20,000 award to a natural or social scientist who's made extraordinary scientific contributions and communicated that knowledge to a broad public in a clear and compelling fashion. Dr. Romsdorf exemplifies the rare combination of superb scientist and powerful, fearless communicator. Here to present the 2022 Stephen Schneider Award is a member of the jury, Christine Russell, senior fellow at Harvard University School, at the Harvard Kennedy School Environment and Natural Resources Program. She is a, an award-winning journalist herself and past president of the National Association of Science Writers. Christine, over to you. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased today to present this year's Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Communication to Dr. Stefan Romsdorf. Uh, as Greg said, not only is he well known as an oceanographer and as a climate scientist, he has made his mark in the world of uh, communi communicating to the general public. He has 135,000 followers on Twitter so when he comments on the state of the oceans, sea level rise, and other extreme weather events, he has a lot of listeners. Dr. Ronsdorf is co-head of research at the Department of Earth Systems Analysis of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, also a professor of physics at the, and oceans at the University of Potsdam in Germany. He is one of the co-founders of the key science blog, Real Climate, and writes a regular column for the German environmental magazine, ZO2. He's even published a children's book, Clouds, Wind, and Weather, on weather and climate. And Dr. Romsdorf was part of the team of scientists who shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, which was for efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such change. Dr. Ronsdorf is very, very much in the tradition of the late Steve Schneider in terms of realizing the importance of telling stories, of humanizing the science, of having scientists' voices part of the conversation rather than standing on the outside. 
So thank you very much, Dr. Robsdorf. I understand you have your trophy prize there with you already. Here it is. There it goes. So, yeah, it's wonderful. I thank you very much uh, for this award. It's a fantastic honor. Um, I'm very touched by the fact that it is the Stephen Schneider Award because I considered Steve really as a very important mentor, not only for the kind of science that I have done, but also for persevering with the public outreach, uh, the climate science communication, uh, despite the kind of uh, rough attacks that you get from some people uh, out there. And uh, also, I'm really humbled by the great pre predecessor uh, winners of this award. It's a fantastic list uh, to be part of. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm, I'm very humbled. And it will really, again, encourage me to continue doing this and uh, go on um, yeah, playing my part not just uh, in advancing the science, but uh, also in advancing the public awareness of the climate crisis that we are now in the middle of. And uh, we have to act really, really fast to prevent a disaster. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Dr. Romstorf, and thank you, uh, Christine, for, for presenting the award. We're honored to have you here and to join this pantheon of, of, uh, of winners. I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team for making this happen. Adam, Megan, Brad, Jenny, Sarah, Catherine, as well as Mark here at the Commonwealth Club. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. Talking about climate can be hard, but we need to do it as we've done here today. And thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. And congratulations again to Dr. Romstorff.